Hey guys, welcome back from Classic Work. We got a hopefully a good little project this morning. We got a D6N that uh she's had a little bit of cracking issue here. Uh, the big rotating boss here to angle the blade back and forth. Uh, it looks to be just a stress crack, but the way that it is. It looks like it's broken this piece of material rather than the weld here. Um, I'm gonna have to gouge into the weld anyways, but I don't, it, it's all the way through. I don't know how thick this piece is, but we're gonna find out here in a minute. So, yep, this should be a hopefully a little quick little job. It don't look like it's gonna be too extensive. Uh, like I said, if that's a half inch plate, it'll be a lot of welding, but we should, uh, it should go through pretty good so let's get after it and let's get started Basically, we're using that carbon gouge to more or less cut the weld out or cut the crack out. You can tell right here that I couldn't get a ground through there, so I had to switch to a grinder and grind the paint off so I could get a ground through it. Wanna... Something that can be a pain in the butt sometimes. As much fire as I flung, you thought that it'd be enough, but. Anyway, so getting up in them tight quarters like that, sometimes you have to break a rod in order to get in there tighter. And the other thing, benefit is to having a small stick out like that, if you don't have any stick out sticking out the back or the side where you could accidentally arc against something. I've had that problem a bunch of times. Um, carbon gouge is not one of my favorite things to do because it's just, it, it's nice, it's real nice, but in certain places like this right here where room is premium, it is not my cup of tea. I just, it's a useful process, but it's, it, there's a lot that could be better, I would say. But anyways, you saw me with the chipping hammer. A lot of times when you're gouging uh, over a spot that you were just at, you'll build up a lot of slag and it'll actually stick to that clean metal. So you have to get it out of the way because that, that old dross is hard to cut through just like with a cutting torch, basically. You've oxidized the metal to a point where it doesn't want to flow very well. So basically in this type of work, you'll gouge out the crack and then you'll go back and widen it out. Try to make air, all of your transitions really smooth. So you're pretty much cutting a ditch, basically. And we're just trying to cut that as thin as we can get it without blowing through. And uh, we'll go back in there and clean it back up with the grinder and make everything nice and sharp and pretty and give it a good place for the weld to flow back in there. As you can see, I broke another rod there to get back on that back side there. And you just take your time. Carbon gouge is fast. You can screw up a lot in a short amount of time. So, you know, don't, don't take too big of bites. Just take a little bit at a time and you can always go back and do a little more. That's uh, basically you know, how you do it. That's before I've cleaned it up. So, if my eyeball's not lying to me, you can see we got a big hole back here. That don't look no more than about a piece of 3 eighths plate. So, uh, let me know in the comments if anybody's ever faced this style of machine before, and if you've run into this. This is the first one I've ever done like this. So I'm wondering if this isn't a problem that's pretty common because 
there's not enough material here. What they should have done is welded this boss on and then put a piece of half inch plate underneath it and more or less made a diamond in there to spread that load out a little bit further into this thinner material. That's what I would have done. But I'm not a caterpillar, so I get it. Yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, it wasn't like it was broke all the heck, but I could see this being a problem on not just this dozer. So that's interesting. But anyways, I'm gonna get in there with a little grinder and clean all that up, and then we'll come back and we'll start welding. So one really important thing you need to do when you're doing a clean out like this is two things. One, if you've done any carbon gouging, be sure that you that you hit it with a grinder everywhere that that rod touched because uh, the graphite in the carbon gouge rod, it'll actually impede your welding. So be sure that you get it off as clean as you can. The other thing too, is you see these gouge marks, okay? Try to round them out as best you can to keep your flux from getting trapped in there. It's not as big deal on like flux core or something like that, but on stick, they love to get in there and really get you a lot of conclusions in your welding. It's very hard to get that, that stuff out of there when they're dug down in them pockets real good. So that is some of the problems I've had in the past with carbon gouging. So round everything out real nice, clean everything. So I got to hit a little bit more up here and do a little bit more dressing up now that I'm down here looking at it. But uh, yeah, be sure that you clean all of your pockets out and even try to give yourself a little bit of a land when you go back in here to weld. So, and uh, be sure that you have hole all the way through where your crack ends. See up here too. That's a pretty big hole. You don't want that big a hole, but you can see the crack doesn't go past there. At least I don't think it does. I hope it don't. I'll find out in a second. But yeah, you get that done. Um, I'm going to start with a 6010 to fill these holes up, which shouldn't take much. It'd be probably less than one rod. And then we'll start with a 332nd 7018. I'll probably put down uh, at least two passes and then we'll fill in cap with a 1 8 as long as we get some, some good little bead in there and then start stacking them in there. I have a lot of people tell me that welding on something this thick, a 332 is not good enough. You can burn a 1 16th in there as long as you've got good puddle control and you get good penetration wherever you got to go. Weld rod size does not matter if you know how to control your puddle. Okay, just because it's a big old glob of hot weld doesn't mean that you put it in there correctly. So, yeah, that's, that's the trick with stuff like this. 332, why I use it is to get in the better angles. You got more puddle control, especially when you're out of position. Then your 1 8 once you've got a good bed laid down, 1 8 should flow right in there real nice since we've got a good ledge to stick to. So, yeah, that's just a little, little take on something like this. You may notice that I've gone ahead and put the other passes in before. I did 6010 pass, 1 8, and filled in the holes. Then I went back with 7018, 332nd to put in my hot pass basically, so that I got plenty of meat there that I'm not going to accidentally blow through with this 1 8. So just going in and stacking beads and getting it in there, getting everything all tied together. Now you may notice I get a lot of comments about this. I push a lot of puddles and I, people ask me all the time, it's like, hey, how do you, you know, I've been taught, you know, from school that you're not supposed to push a puddle like you see me doing right here. There is nothing wrong with pushing a puddle if you know, if you have the experience to do it, basically. Uh, if you got your heat set right, if you know that your angles and everything, that you're not going to, you know, be dragging your slag or anything like that you can push a puddle just as clean as you can drag one. So if you notice here, I'm actually alternating a little bit. I'll push half of one side 
and then I'll drag the other side. Now that little pass that you just saw me put in right there, that was more or less a slight feel. I may have had a little bit of undercut or something like that, like on this one I definitely did. And we used to call these, back in the day, we called them speed beads. You pretty much, you're not trying to put a whole weld in there, you're just trying to build up some thickness. So right here, this is the cover pass for the side that I'm on. And you can tell that I'm pushing this one and I'm gonna stop halfway in the joint. And the reason for this is we'll catch it on the other side where I'm at a much better comfortable angle when we angle the blade back. So this is the second pass right here and I'll stop it just shy of the bottom pass that I put in so it'll have a step in it. Usually stop it between half an inch and three quarters of an inch. And this is the last pass for the cap. And once again, it'll be stopped short of the third pass, or the second pass, I should say. And there you go. And that's the cover pass on that side. into the other side here. I don't know if you can tell, but the sun is coming in from behind me. And with that hood on, I was having a really hard time seeing, because I mean, you got a blinding light reflecting right into your eyeballs. Uh, a lot of your pipeliner guys and stuff like that know about that. A lot of guys run pancake goods, which I should get one one day. But it went in pretty decently well. Uh, no big deal on this. Once again, stack from, from bottom to top. And just be sure you get your, your tie-ins real good. And run over your seam there and, and get a good you know leave out of your crater. And not much to it. Now, one thing I will say right here, this is where I screwed up. I don't know if you can tell, but that rod is a different size. I didn't realize that there was a 332 in my bucket. And I was burning that at like 100 and... 2530 amps, and you'll see right here. What the hell happened? Oh, huh? Did you look at that. <laughs> oh, man. That's what happens when you grab the wrong rod. Oh, that really ain't too bad, considering. All right, let's see if I can do this.
that could have been a little better, but I guess beggars can't be choosers. Nothing to write home about, but it's not bad. this little project up hope you enjoyed it hope you got something out of it all right until next time y'all take care and god bless